Good morning. Thanks for joining me as we continue our journey on our 40 days of prayer and fasting, 40 days, uh, weekdays only through the book of Romans. And we are currently in chapter 7. It's astounding to me that we're already on day 15 as we continue to go through this book. Of course, this book written by the Apostle Paul to the church that was being planted in Rome, a church that he incidentally did not plant. Because usually when you think about Paul, you think of him as a planter of churches that went on missionary journeys. However, a lot of Jewish influence was being felt throughout the new Christian church, and he wants to sort of clarify some of the things that uh, he thinks are very important in regards to Jewish law. Of course, a lot of people were teaching as though Gentile believers now needed to add to their, I guess, repertoire that of learning the Jewish law in order to find salvation and eternal life. Paul was saying this was not uh, the case. I uh, want to say good morning to those who are already joining us for our study. Good morning to Emily. Good morning to Tony. And good morning to Forrest. Thank you guys for joining us. I want to uh, thank everyone who has been a part of this study and continues to be a part of it, whether you watch it live with me or whether you watch it later on. It is so important that you be in prayer for this and continue to follow along. And uh, and just, you know, we're praying that people will get to know God's word in a much more vivid sense. I want to say good morning to Jeanette. Thank you for joining us as well as we wind down another week in the study. So if you join us along the way, please make sure to say hello to us. It means a lot, and it gives me the opportunity to speak back to you. So here it is on a, a Friday if you're joining me live, and I know that uh, uh, everyone's looking forward to a weekend. And at the end of today's uh, time together, we're going to pray for our Sunday service, not only ours in our church, but uh, yours, whoever and wherever you might be. So good morning, Donnie. Thank you for joining us. We're going to pick up where we left off yesterday, and I want to just talk just for a second about Paul is going to touch on the law today from almost a different perspective. I don't know if it was him that checked himself or the Holy Spirit that spoke to him about this, but if you read Romans up through this portion that we've read today, you may get the impression that Paul is saying the law in itself, the old Jewish law given to Moses, uh, from God was wicked, or and uh, it was something that was, or you could see people drawing the conclusion that that Paul was liking it, liking it unto slavery. And he said, "No, it's not the law in and of itself. It's the way man has treated it. It has bought, it has bound man. It has somehow become that which has been a stumbling block to man as they've attempted to walk. But the law in itself didn't do that." It's the sinful nature in man and the sinful need that man has to somehow uh, constantly have this, uh, I'm trying to think of, of whenever you go, uh, someone to watch over them, almost as though you go on a date and you need a chaperone. And Paul's saying, you know, we, we don't really have to have that chaperone with us all the time anymore. Because we should be able, I'm, uh, I'm having some difficulty in the projection, I apologize. We are using a new network, so now I think it's back to normal. Uh, I want to say good morning to Helen. And he's saying we don't really have to have that chaperone anymore. Instead, we should live joyfully and, uh, in, a, in a sense, redeemed and be able to show the love of Christ in that there, there's this old stagnant nature that uh, that the law brings about in mankind. So Paul immediately, as we look at the study today, wants to make it clear that the law in itself is not wicked. It's the way man has handled it. So let's look, if you will, for just a second here in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. He says, you know, comes right out and says, it's not the law in and of itself that Moses received from God that's the sinfulness. It's the way we handle it. Listen to what he says. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. I said several days ago, a child doesn't know that it's wrong to take a toy from another child until someone tells them it's wrong. A lot of things in life we don't realize are wrong until someone calls it to our attention. And that's what he's saying. The law was written in order that the people years ago, generations ago, through the present, would know what was wrong, what was sinful. And so it's important that we understand that the law in itself, what explains these things to us, there's nothing wrong with the law. It's the way that man has sort of tied himself to it in a way that's caused it to be a stumbling block. Hey, good morning. Some people joining us. Good morning to Daryl and Darlene. 
Good morning to Tamara. So good to hear from you guys this morning as well. Listen to what he says in verse 8 as he takes this on. But sin, it's sin, sin within, sin that uh, comes from the inner being, sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of coveting. Said when I learned about coveting, then I started wanting to covet. Because prior, it didn't occupy my mind. Now that I know what coveting is, I'm more apt to think more upon it. For apart from the law, sin was dead. In other words, think of it as like a big amplifier or a spotlight to your life saying, you are guilty of this sin. Prior to that, I didn't know I was guilty of the sin. But since the law tells me, now I realize I am. Because he goes on to say, but sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Until I learned about it, I just went on in my way, and I was happy, but I didn't realize that I was sinning. The law instead shined a light in me over that. Uh, St. Augustine once wrote, many years ago, he was a great, uh, if you don't know who St. Augustine was, he was someone who uh, had several manuscripts about walking in the Christian life, and he said that, one night, he stole a bunch of pears from a pear tree that was near his home. He said it wasn't the fact that the pears were any better than pears he already had. It was just the act in and of itself of taking the pears. He said, once I tasted the pears, and he said, I didn't taste many pears, but I stole a whole bunch of them. He said, I threw the rest of them to the pigs. He said, it really wasn't the act of wanting the pear so much. It was the sin of taking the pears. And so he's talking about how, you know, it just entices the, the man and his sinful nature to perform the deed. Sin takes advantage of it. It seizes the opportunity. If you know about prohibition, people drank during the time of prohibition, not so much because they wanted to drink so badly, it was because it was forbidden. If you think about the Garden of Eden, and you go back, it was the forbidden fruit that enticed Eve. You know, of course, Satan put it before her eyes, but you know, it's because of those things that are forbidden that entice us to uh, to want to sin, to want to transgress, to want to cross the line. Uh, we, we see the speed limit. Well, I can go a little bit faster than that and not get caught. So we find out what the limitations are, and sinful nature wants us to go beyond that. And that's what Paul is saying. The law tells us what is wrong. So the law is good, but it, it also, sin takes advantage of that law and entices us to be more sinful. Let's keep uh, Let's keep looking here. Verse 10, I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Again, for sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. I read an illustration before our study today that was incredible. It was about a hotel in Florida. And they posted signs on their balcony that said, absolutely, fishing is prohibited from the balcony. Well, guess what people did? They started to fish from the balcony. It caused all kinds of problems. People were complaining. People on lower decks, particularly lower levels, were complaining to the management. It seemed like they were constantly having to deal with these people trying to fish from the balcony. One day, they decided to take the signs down from the balcony that prohibited fishing from the balcony. And you know what happened? Nobody thought to fish from the balcony. So there was no more problems with anyone throwing in lines from the balcony. Why? Because it never entered their head. It's exactly the same thing Paul is talking about here. Once the law enters our minds, sin takes the opportunity, advantage of that, and causes us to do things that are against the law. Verse 12, so then the law is holy. The commandment itself is holy. And that's exactly what he says. And the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Verse 13, did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly Sinful. You and I are all going to die. There's a 100% chance of death in mankind. You cannot avoid it unless Jesus would return. And even then we'd be transformed and so forth. But nevertheless, we read that and we understand why now sin leads to death. Sin takes the opportunity to take that which is holy and warp it in our systems and provoke us 
to transgress it. Therefore, we eventually sin by breaking the law, which leads to death and eternal damnation. That's why it's so important that we know the resurrected Christ and wrap ourselves in him so that through his salvation that is offered to us or that we receive, we receive his mercy and grace, therefore are wrapped up in him to eternal life. I hope that's a clear lesson. It's a good one to think about for the next couple of days here this weekend because we need to realize it's not the law in itself that's sinful, although it's easy to draw that conclusion by what Paul has written to this point. No, it's the law which makes it clear to us just how sinful sin is and makes us more aware of our sinful nature in that we tend to be prone to transgress that which is holy once we learn about it. Hey, good morning, Juliana. Thank you for joining me. If there's someone out else out there who hasn't said hello to, I invite you to so I can say hello to you as well. I want you to be encouraged by this word today, and I hope you'll share it with someone. Let's pray for our services this Sunday, not only ours in our church, but if you're just part of our online congregation, we want to pray for your church as well, that God will have his way and move in the services. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this time we could share in your word and for Paul's explanation. We pray today that we will understand that the law and the commandments are holy, but the sinful nature of mankind causes us to transgress many times. It puts in us the idea of transgression. And Father, we need your help. We need the Holy Spirit to cover and coat us and make us righteous people so that we might truly be able to resemble Christ. Father, we pray for our services this Sunday in our churches. May you reign from the pulpits. May you have your way with every speaker, every song. And Lord, may you challenge our hearts and revive us. We pray, Lord, that not only will our church be revived at Gold Hill Wesleyan, but Father, we pray throughout that every Bible-believing church will speak the truth and that people will find Jesus. And Lord, in finding the truth, we shall be free. And that's exactly what our prayer is as we look into the law today, knowing the truth and living the truth, we shall be free in Christ. Help us to show his love and his righteousness to others. Help us to welcome people into our congregations. Help us to be loving, to love you with all our hearts, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Whoever comes in the door, may they feel welcome in God's house. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. I hope you have an incredible weekend, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. And Lord willing, I hope to see you Monday as we continue our study on day 16.